That's a good question. And uh, I don't think I'd like to buy good companies at, at, at what I think they're worth. I really liked, I, I have no buy, problem buying a good company, but I wanted it at a discount. I'm looking for, to make a profit, and I don't want to lose money. And if you can, at times, once in a while, people get very nervous, and you can buy a good company at a fair price. I, I don't really like, I can't generalize, because each company is different. But, uh, but if, you, uh, if you want to make a profit, you really want to buy a stock at a price that you think it'll go up say 50 percent. Now it may take several years for that stock to go up and then you just have to be patient. Now one day, this goes back to about 1951, you weren't around and so forth, but the fellow came to me and he said, you know, uh, they're the company that we're interested in, that uh, the, uh, one of the, um, I can't even remember the name of it, it was a, it was a, a, a company uh, that annual, analyzed other companies and he said this particular company said that there's a there's a method there where they can uh, copying machines and it's the Battelle Institute in New York I think it's in New York State has said this company has great possibilities stock was selling uh, it, it was selling at about 20 uh, and it had lived well through the depression it was listed on the exchange it was a small company and I went into Mr. Graham and I said, you know, this company's got a new product, you know, a copying machine. And he said, well, you know, Walter, we don't really buy stocks like that. Well, of course, it was Xerox. And it went up a great deal. And the only consolation I had was that I, it had gone from 20 where we saw it, it had gone to 50, they would have been out of it. And the fact that it went up to 1,000 to 2,000 after splits, he, 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 I, I wouldn't have bought it. Uh, I bought it only because historically there seemed to be an interesting stock. But but it but he was right that it really you, you didn't know that the, that this particular product was going to be such a success. The only thing you could say was the Vettel Institute said that it was good. So you, what you try to do when I invest is not to lose money, and to do that you usually want to buy stocks that are having problems. And most companies, when they have problems, get some help. It doesn't, you know, the directors are upset, the president is upset, why is the company doing badly? And that's one reason I like companies which have no debt, because then you don't have to worry about paying it off. And uh, then you want to look and see why. It, quite often, the stock market acts emotionally. People act emotionally. Bad news, you know, bad news is, uh, causes trouble. So what you try to do is you try not to get involved with the emotions of buying and selling. You are looking for things that are ugly, cheap, boring, out of fashion, small and obscure, or otherwise on the other side of the existing finance industry mania. If it's on the recommended list of one of the big retail brokerages, my advice to you is watch out. <laughs> Value investing consists of a basic approach to the process of investing. The first thing you have to do is identify potential investments that you're going to look at. What you are looking for is stocks that are obscure. It's stocks that are small capitalization because Big institutions aren't going to be able to afford the time to concentrate on analyzing those stocks. In what we really want to do is buy businesses that we would be happy to own forever. It's the same. We never buy something with a price target in mind. I mean, we never buy something at 30 saying if it goes to 40, we'll sell it or 50 or 60 or 100. We just don't do it that way any more than when we buy a private business like Seize Candy for 25 million. We don't say to ourselves if it ever if we ever got an offer of 50 million for this business, we'd sell it. That, that's just not the way to look at a business. I look at a business is, is this going to keep producing more and more and more money over time? And if the answer to that is yes, you don't need to ask any more questions. Uh, also, as long as we're talking about risk, you cannot, or we cannot, talk of a risk-reward ratio. A risk-reward ratio uh, comes into being when prices are in equilibrium. Uh, you say, um, 
the higher the risk, the more the gain. Um, which is true if prices are in what are called equilibrium. But we try and buy at very low prices, and the lower the price, the greater the potential for gain. The lower the price, the less the investment risk. Uh, so our, our approach to risk is different than the conventional risk is one we need to put an adjective in front of risk and two we don't believe there is a risk reward ratio for us thing really mean well i mean the simplest version of it which is the most uninformative is to say you look at what you're buying and you try and get bargains you try and buy something that's worth a dollar for fifty cents the reason that's uninformative is that nobody says they're a non-value investor right. nobody pays a buck fifty for dollar stocks. Well, sometimes they do. So, like, <laughs> sometimes not not, they do not accidentally. consciously, anyway. So really what it has to do with is, I think, two things. Yeah. One is taking advantage of deep-seated human behaviors that make bargains available. Because the fundamental reality of investing is that whenever you buy a stock thinking it's going to do well, somebody else is selling you that stock thinking it's going to do badly, and one of you is always wrong. So it's, and it's, you want to be on the right side of that trade. So it is looking for ugly, cheap, disappointing, boring, obscure <laughs> stocks. And the evidence is they significantly outperform the market. So maybe you shouldn't feel too good when you're investing is the point if you if jump in on this whole thing. If you look at a stock and you look at it and you say, yuck, I'm not touching that, that is a value opportunity. <laughs> if you look at a stock and say, that's going to make me rich. That is not a value opportunity, the evidence indicates. So it's buying really cheap things that are cheap because most people cannot see through the superficial diseases or other things that those But how do you are. know when they are superficial diseases or when uh, a stock is just a dog? Uh, right. What are the that measures you should really look at? That is the second half of value investing. Yeah. So the opportunities are created because these stocks have diseases or the economy has a disease back in February. And the challenge is to look extremely carefully. And there is a way that Ben Graham and, of course, Warren Buffett taught people to look at these stocks that is much more revealing than the standard analysis. When you think about the intelligent investor, Graham talks about the margin of safety. You want to buy a dollar for 50 cents because it protects your corpus, your principal. You're unlikely to lose. Almost impossible to lose if the company doesn't have any litigation against it or the balance sheet's not highly lever leveraged. Um, but what they don't talk about a lot in the intelligent investor is that parsimony is very profitable. By stealing this company at half a value and have the market properly weight, you pick up another 17 points a year of compounding. How worried are you by the declines in the share price of Berkshire Hathaway, the difficulties the company's in? No? This is the third time that Warren and I have seen our holdings in Berkshire go down top tick to bottom tick by 50 percent. I think it's in the nature of long-term shareholding with the normal vicissitudes in, in worldly outcomes and in markets that, that the long-term holder has his quoted value of his stock go down and then by say 50 percent. In fact, you can argue that if you're not willing to react with equanimity to a market price decline of 50 percent two or three times a century, you're not fit to be a common shareholder and you deserve the mediocre result you're going to get compared to the people who do have the temperament who can be more philosophical about these market fluctuations. I was thrilled to be hired at Fidelity. Some interns like me were put to work researching companies and writing reports just like the regular analysts. The whole business was suddenly demystified. Even a liberal arts major can analyze a stock. I went to Wharton after that interlude at Fidelity more skeptical than ever about the value of academic stock market theory. It seemed to me that most of what I was learning at Wharton could only help you fail in the investment business. I studied statistics, advanced calculus, and quantitative analysis. Quantitative analysis taught me that the things I saw happening at Fidelity couldn't really be happening. It was also obvious that the Wharton professors who believe in academic theories weren't doing nearly as well as my new colleagues at Fidelity. 
So I cast my lot with the practitioners, and my distrust of theorizers continues. He says, if you have trouble imagining a 20% loss in the market, you probably shouldn't be in stocks. After the last five years where equity markets, despite some dips, have really only gone up, I think it's very important for investors to remember that stocks do and can go down and probably should go down over some periods of time as the economy goes through the inevitable cycles that it's going to go through. This is where the onus is really on the investor to ensure that they know themselves, that they know how they're going to react in the event that markets do react adversely over a short period of time and have their plan appropriately structured so that they're not going to get caught up into changing their strategy in, result, in response to what is simply an ordinary market move. The events of the last few years have shown that buy and hold investing is dead. What do you think? I don't think it's right. Uh, the first thing that's important to realize is that's exactly what people say right before buy and hold comes back to life. <laughs> I mean, Nobody said that when the Dow was over 14,000, when buying and holding was a really dangerous idea. People only say it when the Dow is down around 8,000. But it's cheap now. And it's impossible for me to conceive that buy and hold is a worse idea with the Dow at 8,000 than it was at 14,000, when nobody was saying buy and hold was a bad idea. Well. Given what you're saying is correct, what about people who think that the market is in kind of a long-term trading range or that we in a long-term bear market that could go on for years the way it did from 1966 to 1982? Um, anytime you buy in here, it's going to take you years and years to get back to where you were. I mean, and that you, people should invest more actively. What do you say to that? Well, there's a legitimate case to be made that we could be looking at a, at a protracted period where market returns are below average. But that doesn't necessarily mean that trading more is going to raise your return. Every time you trade, you incur trading costs, brokerage costs, which are lower now than they used to be, but they're still real. And if you can buy and hold through a period of protracted low returns, the flip side of that is you're buying at lower market valuations than you could have done years earlier. And people who bought and held from, say, 1966 to 1982, or even from 1929 into the 1940s and 50s, people who bought and held did quite well. It was the people who only held who suffered. Okay. And if you're on the verge of retirement, you've got a big problem. But if you're younger, Buying and holding right now is a spectacular idea. So when people say buy and hold, though, they also don't mean buy once, then don't put another dime in and wait for it to go up. They mean buying steadily, not trying to decide where you think the market is bottom, but keep buying at lower prices regularly. Yeah, exactly. And, and maybe, maybe when we talk, we use the wrong kinds of terminology. Maybe we shouldn't say investing. Maybe we should say saving. And if you, if you think of putting money into the financial markets as a form of saving, you don't expect to get your return right away. You expect to get it over time. And I think that trips people up. And certainly returns lately have been terrible. So if it's going to pay off, you Ketcher captured the idea himself in his 1964 article, right. The Super Investors at Graham and Doddsville. Right. And in it, he talks about value investing is like an inoculation. You either get it yeah. right away or you right. never get it. And I think it's just true. I actually think there's a gene for this stuff, whether it's a value investing gene or a contrarian gene. I think that, that everybody appreciates a bargain, but when the market's going down, most people overreact and get scared. My stock is going down, what am I gonna do? So if you're buying a sweater and it goes on sale from $400 to 150, you get excited when you get yeah. to the store, but if you have a stock or you bought the sweater at 400, maybe you're not so happy. So I think it's, for me, it's natural, but for a lot of people, it's fighting human nature. But it, it is true. What, it's what Warren Buffett said. When you find out about it, it's like being let in on this little secret. And so if you can remember that stocks aren't pieces of paper that gyrate all the time, that stocks are fractional interest in businesses, it all makes sense. You have to, it's almost like you have to slow the game down, like they talk about baseball speeding up on you. You need to slow it down. I can buy this thing for a huge fraction of what it's worth, what am I worried about if it goes down a okay, little bit Okay, well, so what's the gift here, knowing what it's worth? 
I think that the, the analysis is actually the easy part. Uh, when, I, when I speak to business school students, I tell them investing is the intersection of economics and psychology. The economics, the valuation of a business is not that hard. The psychology, how much do you buy? Do you buy it at this price? Do you wait for a lower price? What do you do when, when it looks like the world might end? Those things are harder, and knowing whether you stand there, buy more, or something legitimately has gone wrong and you need to sell, those are harder things. And that you learn over with experience. You learn by having the right make psychological. You don't need it. You don't need a lot of brains in this business. I mean, I've always said if you got an IQ of 160, give away 30 points to somebody else because you don't need it in investments. What you do need is emotional stability. You have to, you have to be able to think independently, and you have to be, you have to be. When you come to a conclusion, you have to really not care what other people say, and 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 just follow the facts and follow your reasoning, and and that's that's tough for a lot of people. But, uh, that part, I, I think, I was just lucky with. I was born that way. In terms of uh, emotions, it's a truism that investing emotions are your enemy. Absolutely. That uh, when the market's good, if you feel good, don't. If you feel bad, you should probably do it. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, how, uh, how, how did you, uh, what, what was that extra thing where uh, so many will acknowledge that, and yet we saw in the current crisis, they, they panicked while you went into seemingly uh, potential disasters like GE and uh, Goldman Sachs. Yeah. I can't really tell you the answer. I mean, I didn't learn in school or anything. I just, it never bothered me if people disagreed with what I thought, uh, as long as I felt I knew the facts. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of things I don't know a thing about. I just stay away from those. Uh, so I stay within what I call my circle of competence. You know, that uh, Tom Watson said it best. He said, you know, he said, he said, I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots, and I stay around those spots. Well, I try and stay around those spots, and I, I just don't have a a problem if if, uh, if somebody says you know you're wrong on something I just I go back and look at the facts and, and, and it, I think that I think that really is much more important frankly than than having a few points of IQ or or having an extra course or two in, in school or anything of the sort you need emotional stability what's your advice to people in terms of the stock market now patience be a long-term investor be prepared financially and psychologically to live through a series of bull markets and bear markets because in the long run, common stocks will pay off enormously. The next bull market will be carry prices far higher than this one. Why? Because the whole nation is growing more rapidly. Gross national product of the nation will double in at least the next 10 years. We think the gross national product of the nation 40 years from now will be 64 times as high as it is now. And that will be reflected in sales volume and profits and share prices. So that from a long-term investment standpoint, it's a question of when should you put your money into stocks. We can't give you the exact day, but sometime the bull market will start again and you want to be in on it. The key is instead of making decisions in response to what the market does, which means you're permanently in reactive mode, instead of doing that, you put rules in place in advance and policies and procedures. You, one very simple rule could be never sell a stock purely because the price has gone down. Never buy a stock exclusively because the price has gone up. An even better rule is don't think of them as stocks at all. Think of them as companies. Th and, that's right. And Benjamin Graham, Warren it's Buffett. straight out of Graham and right. Buffett. And once you start thinking about them as companies with products and services, the daily price of the stock and those 40,000 fluctuations a day start to fall by the wayside, and you can maybe take a more calmer and more detached term. Uh, bonds fundamentally fall when interest rates rise. Uh, they rise when interest rates fall. And we've been through a prolonged period where more or less irregularly interest rates have been falling. But we've also had very long periods of time where interest rates have been rising. And when you go back through history, you find many periods, which I document in the book, where for very long time periods, bonds actually lose money many more years than not. People don't think that happens, and we're not used to that recently. But the fact of the matter is that really bonds are risky if we're going to have a long-term rising interest rate environment. If you don't, Consuelo, when you said, you know, people could buy a stock today and lose a lot of money tomorrow, mm -hmm. This is the big disconnect. You see, there's a difference between price and value, right? Price is what you pay, value is what you get. 
Now, if, if, if somebody watching the show owned an apartment building, right, and they paid a million dollars, had a few units in it, and when they bought it, it generated $70,000 of, of income after the expenses. And a few years later, it was up to eighty or 90000 The fact that what somebody might pay for that building could swing all around, right? It might be one day somebody would offer them a million and a half, and the next day there's no bid. That doesn't mean the value of the building has changed, just because the price has changed. So going back to what you said, people can lose a lot of money buying stocks today, tomorrow. It depends what the business is worth. Now, if they're forced to sell, then you're absolutely right. Stocks are a very dangerous asset class to be in if you're thinking, I need to raise money for three months from now or for one year from now or two years. But if you can get in systematically over time, then lower prices and volatility, just like David said, is your friend. And if you can think of the underlying businesses and the difference between price and value, then the market volatility becomes much less unsettling. So you're, you're an advocate of dollar cost averaging, essentially, yes. in, in high quality companies. It's huge. It's, it's something that works so well. It's no wonder that Ben Graham wrote a chapter about it, that it met. And yet somehow people think, no, when prices go up, I get more excited because the world's safer. I'll invest more. When prices are down, I'm panicked. I'll wait on the sidelines for it to get better. That is destructive, self-destructive behavior. And investors destroy the returns over time by getting in after things have gone up, getting out after they've gone down. If there's one thing they could change, it wouldn't even be to reverse that. That's too hard. But if they can simply be disciplined, do the same amount every month or every quarter or every year, average in, rebalance, have that discipline, they'll be very, get very satisfactory returns over time. Does Ford have any competitive advantage over the other big global car companies? And the answer is no. So you'd like a methodology that incorporates those kind of assumptions into your valuation. And that's what Graham and Dodd developed. Always start with the assets. Then look at the earnings power and see if it's protected by the assets. And only then, and this is what Buffett taught people to do, look to pay something for growth. Because growth is only valuable if the investment in growth earns more than the cost of capital. And if it doesn't, growth can destroy value. Growth is not a valuable thing as a rule. So and if you're going to buy that, you better be very sure of the franchise. Not tell you the probabilities of future financial things happening. And they had a great reliance on mathematics. And they felt that, that the bait of the stock told you something about the risk of the stock. It doesn't tell you a damn thing about the risk of the stock, in my view. And, uh, uh, and, and sigmas do not tell you about the risk of going broke, in, in my view. To make money they didn't have and didn't need, they risked what they did have and did need. And that's foolish. That is just plain foolish. It doesn't make any difference what your IQ is. If you, if you risk something that is important to you for something that is unimportant to you, it just does not make any sense. I don't care whether the odds are 100 to 1 that you succeed or 1,000 to 1. That but uh, first off, what is value investing? It's attempting to buy a stock or other, uh, or other financial asset for less than it's worth. Um, and this is sort of in contrast to greater fool investing, which is buying something and hoping that somebody else comes along and buys it from you uh, at, a, at a greater price at some point down the road. Um, so let me dispel some of the myths about value investing. Uh, traditionally, well, you've got growth investing on one side and value investing on the other side is how, is how uh, you know, most people think about it. Um, but in fact, uh, that distinction is, is meaningless. Growth is a component of value, but something, uh, uh, something can be uh, value, i.e. trading at less than what it's worth, uh, and, and have no growth at all, or even declining growth. Uh, uh, negative growth, uh, shrinking, um, or, or, and by the way, growth is not always good. Some companies destroy value as they grow. The, the intrinsic value diminishes as the company invests recklessly in growth, for example. Um, so growth is, is one of many components of calculating what something is worth. Um, but, but don't confuse uh, growth, uh, that growth and value investing are necessarily different things. And in fact, Charlie Munger has, uh, has said it best, where all intelligent investing is value. I don't like to lose money, and therefore I try to buy stocks which I think are somewhat protected on the downside, and then the upside sort of takes care of itself. So the main thing, I think, is to look for companies which don't have a lot of debt, and I don't like the idea of, of, of people, uh, uh, well, I'll put it this way. I'd like to get their annual reports. 
and you can see a little bit about from the proxy statements and the annual report how much stock the directors own, who owns a fair amount of stock, and also the history of the company. And I thought uh, the idea of buying a company with a large amount of debt, even though I, uh, it, it could work out well because of the leverage, I don't like it. So I look for companies that are selling new, at new lows. Well, when you buy a stock at a new low, it usually has problems. So I don't like debt. Uh, debt gets people in a lot of trouble, as you know, if you read about MBIA and these other companies that have lent money and, and then find out they're in really in trouble. So I like buying companies which are usually a rather simple capital. They don't have a lot of debts. Uh, they have management owns a fair amount of stock. Uh, they are they have a history about them too. You look at a you look at a company and you see how long has it been in business, and uh, what kind of business are they in? Now I was never very good at judging people's character as such. If you go to a, 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 a talk to a management, they may be charming people. They may be very nice but you don't know anything about them. So I found it really was better for me to look at the numbers than to try to look at the people themselves. Uh, and it, it's, it serves you, particularly if they don't have a lot of debt. If they don't have a lot of debt, uh, usually that's fairly safe. Now, once in a while, a company, after you own it, <laughs> decides they're going to buy another company and they issue a lot of debt. But if you look at the background of a company and see their history, uh, and that's where value line is somewhat helpful because they usually have 10 or 15 year backs, so you can see where the company was and where it is today. And uh, I don't know if I answer your questions, but the idea is I don't like to lose money. Uh, one would have to be very patient. One doesn't have to necessarily have all one's portfolio invested all the time. So my belief is that one has to stay very strongly contrarian and uh, you don't need all your, your uh, you know, money on the craft table all the time. Sometimes the best thing is to do absolutely nothing. So if markets are high, uh, don't invest and be, be very selective and keep your standards. Qualification. Warren and I have not made our way in life by making successful macroeconomic predictions sure. and betting on our conclusions. Our system is to swim as competently as we can, and sometimes the tide will be with us, and sometimes it will be against us. But by and large, we don't much bother with trying to predict the tides because we plan to play for the game for a long time. I recommend to all of you exactly the same attitude. It's kind of a snare and a delusion to outguess macroeconomic cycles. Very few people do it successfully, and some of them do it by accident. When the game is that tough, why not adopt the other system of swimming as competently as you can and figuring that over a long life you'll have your share of good tides and bad tides. And so and with that qualification, of course, everybody has some ideas on the economy. But I want you to understand that these ideas do not have the credibility of anybody who's successfully made macroeconomic predictions. In other words, they may not be. <laughs> Which is one of our list, most popular features. It's a good list. <laughs> so tell me about this list of great balance sheets and yeah. high dividend yields. Growing dividends. Growing yields. dividends. High, growing, high balance sheet and growing dividends. So is what your do list. I tell people? I said diversification, you know, 25, 30 stocks, uh, companies that tend to make products that, that people want or need. Um, the balance sheets are good. The di there's a history of dividend increases or the ability for companies to raise dividends, but the, the, the history of them, it's, it's a, I think it's a really good list. I, you know, I, I really, and, in, and in fact, I, I, own, I own them all. I own them all myself because we actually have a program that does that, and, I, and that's my, my two biggest investments are that program, the separately managed account, and, and the equity income mutual fund. Those are good. So, I'm not, again, I'm not touting those, but I, you know, I like them. I believe in it, and, and why wouldn't I? So if individuals come and say, what do you do? I say, these are great companies. So tell me, uh, Procter & Gamble has been paying dividends 
for a hundred and some odd years and, and has raised it for 50 consecutive, whatever it is, 50 consecutive. Kimberly Clark, it's like a bond with a, um, with a rising coupon. Kimberly, it's an incredibly well-run company. People are going to still be uh, using uh, diapers and facial tissue and, and paper towels and, and disposable um, hospital things. And it was yielding four and a quarter percent a year ago, and, and they've raised the dividend. They've raised the dividend every year for 40 years, and Tom Falk has done a great job uh, running the company. Johnson & Johnson, even though they stubbed their toe with the consumer products, and it drives me crazy, still raised their dividend 6% this year, and they've raised their dividend every year since, uh, I, I, Who knows I don't when. know when. Right. 3M has raised its dividend every year for, I don't know, 45 years, and they make products that everybody, uh, those, are, those, are, those are good. So how do you use that list? I mean, when, when do you invest levels, in them? When do you we set levels on, on what prices we'll pay. And when they hit it, when they hit those levels, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll trigger the buys. And if stocks get, if they get too expensive, uh, we'll, we'll uh, maybe nip some off. Key way to have a stomach to withstand the volatility of the stock market is to be secure yourself. You've got to feel comfortable that you've got enough money in the bank that you don't need what you have invested uh, unless uh, for many years. That's a key factor. Number two, you have to recognize that uh, the stock market in the short term is what we call a voting machine. It really represents the whims of people in the short term. Uh, stock prices are affected by many things, by events going on in the world that really have nothing to do with the value of certain companies that you invest in. So you've got to just accept the fact that what you own can go down meaningfully in value after you buy it. That doesn't necessarily mean you've made an investment mistake. It's just the nature of the volatility of the stock market. How do you get comfortable? You don't just buy a stock because you like the name of the company. You do your own research. You get a good understanding of the business. You make sure it's a business that you understand. You make sure the price you're paying is reasonable relative to the earnings of the company. Business, this business for 57 years, uh, and I have never seen anything like it in my life. I've never seen anything like the amount of speculation that's going on in the market, which is basically twice as much stock trading, twice as much turnover as we had in 1929, the previous high. Uh, we have these frequent days. We've had 37 of them in the last year where the market's gone up or down 2% uh, or more. And uh, when I came into this business in 1951, we might have had three or four days a year like that. Twelve times as many wild and woolly days as history would have said. So we've just we've taken the whole focus of market participation in our capitalistic system here in the U.S., uh, from one of investment to one of speculation. And I happen to think that's a tragedy in which the investors are the losers, and which, of course, somebody's a winner. Wall Street wins. Uh, they make $650 billion a year in fees and commissions and all that kind of thing, which means that investors lose that much. The next emotional decision that we make a mistake on is we tend to hold on to our dogs too long. It's very common to hear the comment, I'm just waiting until my funds get back to where they were, and then I'm going to get out. This is a very common perspective. Even though you may have a portfolio that is not aligned with your values, it is very difficult to sell out when you're going to lock in losses. Here's a chart of Nortel going all the way back to the peak of the bubble of technology in 2000, at $120 a share, now being valued in the pennies. And even along the way, there were rallies back that caused people to feel that they could dollar cost average and own more of the shares only to find it go down further. The basic premise, instead of holding on to our dogs, is to ask ourselves, if we don't want to own a stock, why do we still own it? That should give you the reason to sell. So you're buying, you think you're buying a 50 cent dollar, okay? Um, uh, so uh, your, your, your midpoint of that range is 20, so you think it's worth 20, you're buying it at 10. And then the company announces some piece of bad news, really bad news, that causes you to rethink your entire investment thesis. And now you don't think it's worth 18 to 22. You think it's worth four to six. Okay? And let's say for some reason the market hasn't figured out how bad this news is. And the stock goes from 10 to 8. Okay? What should you do? Logically, what should you do that instant? Sell that stock, right? It's now trading at a. 60% premium to the midpoint of your intrinsic value of $5, it's at 8 right? And the U.S. government's paying you to sell it, right? Because you can take a tax loss. Okay? So there's extra incentive to sell it. Okay, what do most people do? They wait until it comes back to 10 before they sell. Okay? Because they don't want to book that loss because they, you know, they're down 20%, they're feeling bad about this loss, 
etc. And even though they would never buy it at eight, uh, they'll, they'll hold on, hoping it comes back to the price at which they bought it before they sell.